Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the third Marshall Society event of this year. We're joined today by the Harvard Professor for International Political uh, Economics, Danny Roderick. He's the author of the books Economics Rules and The Globalization Paradox, and he's also the winner of the 2002 Leon TF Prize. He's going to be speaking today about reimagining globalization, and there's going to be plenty of time for questions, so please submit those in the live chat if you have any uh, as we go along. So over to you, Professor Roderick. Um, thank you, George. It's very nice to be a guest of the uh, uh, Marshall Society. Uh, it's uh, uh, Alfred Marshall is, of course, um, uh, not only a, a well-known um, uh, economist, but also it's the kind of economist that that I I, I, um, I aspire to be because of his um, not just very strong. Um, uh, theoretical acumen, but also his his sort of very much on the ground, you know, feet on the ground kind of thinking, uh, real world based uh, economics in which um, in which he excelled. Um, so it's it's a particular pleasure pleasure to be speaking under the auspices of uh, Marshall Society. Um, so I'll, I'll give her some remarks for maybe about twenty minutes about um, where I see us having gone wrong with. Um, economic globalization and where I think uh, some re reorientation may profitably uh, take place. Um, and one of the arguments uh, I want to make is, is for us to understand, you know, sort of that, that globalization is not just one thing, that there have been different visions of globalization in the past, that you know, globalization has a certain amount of plasticity, plasticity in, in how we think about it. And one way of uh, making that point is to go a little bit back in, in history, not too long, uh, but to the origin of the post-war uh, international uh, economic uh, system and, and to, to uh, um, appreciate how different our image of uh, what a trade regime was back then. This is now from the original preamble uh, to the general agreements, uh, general agreement on tariffs and trade in 1947, the sort of the founding document of post-war um, trade. And when we look at that document, and we find sort of what what was the objectives of signing a trade agreement, a global trade agreement. Uh, the objectives are listed here as raising the standard of living, ensuring full employment. Uh, a steadily growing volume of real income and effective demand, developing the full use of the resources of the, of the world, and expanding exchange of goods, which is really what about expanding trade is, is almost like an afterthought. Uh, the, the objectives are very much in ensuring full employment, product, productive um, uh, uh, national economies. And by the time we come to sort of much more recent uh, trade agreements, uh, you know, the whole set of, you know, the means and the ends have become topsy-turvy, you know, that the, the objectives are now explicitly stated in terms of, uh, this is now from the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership from 2006, where the objective is stated explicitly as promoting economic integration uh, to liberalize uh, trade and investment. Um, that's sort of the first objective. Even more so, we get to CETA, you know, closer to home to Europe. Uh, um, there, uh, you know, the objective are stated as expanded and secure market for goods and services through the reduction or elimination of barriers to trade and investment. Um, so, you know, basically the objectives have now become eliminating barriers to trade and investment. Um, and, and the goals of um, ensuring full employment, uh, growing volume of real income and effective demand, full use of the resource of the world, it's not even sort of, it's, it's not mentioned. Um, and I think this sort of reflects uh, this, this very quick history um, of the uh, evolution of international trade agreements over time in terms of what we view them as, as, as targeting, uh, reflects a, a kind of, um, uh, a movement from one kind of globalization at the end of the, uh, that was designed at the end of the Second World War to a different kind of globalization, which I've called hyper-globalization, uh, that sort of evolves uh, back um, after, sometime after the 1990s. Uh, so under the traditional model of uh, trade liberalization or trade agreement and the kind of conceptual framework, the conceptual apparatus that was uh, created with the GATT, 
on the part of trade and the IMF uh, with regard to the international monetary system. Essentially, uh, trade agreements uh, were restricted at, um, at simply tackling uh, explicit barriers at the border, like import tariffs, import uh, quotas, um, and they were limited in scope. Um, and there was a lot of compensation of potential uh, losers. Um, on the financial front, um, uh, under the rules of the IMF, under the uh, Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, it was taken for granted that exchange rates would be managed, uh, the capital account, capital flows would also be managed. Um, and sort of that regime of uh, limited liberalization, or li at least sort of li li liberalization restricted uh, to trade um, at, at, the, at, at to, to, uh, restrictions at the border and management of capital flows uh, um, left significant amount of policy space and autonomy for each country to really develop their own developmental model or their own social welfare model. Well, in fact, um, even though this was a, a very shallow, uh, relatively narrow model of globalization, if you look at the volume of trade or the volume of long-term investment and the uh, three decades or so after um, uh, the uh, uh, end of the Second World War. In fact, uh, the world economy flourished. Uh, global trade, in fact, has increased more rapidly um, in the three decades, let's say between 1945 and 1980, uh, than it has increased since 1990. So this was a successful model of globalization, but with a very different set of priorities. I think the hyper-globalization model, which I think uh, essentially, the cornerstones of which were the creation of the World Trade Organization in the mid-1990s, the mushrooming and uh, spread of free trade agreements with um, uh, deep integration uh, arrangements that went significantly beyond the World Trade Organization, and um, the acceptance, the beginning of acceptance of free capital mobility and financial globalization as a norm rather than an exception, I think sort of reverse the, the priority so that, that in the hyper-globalization model, increasingly we're talking about regulations behind the border, uh, policies uh, behind the border, such as industrial policies, subsidies, um, you know, consumer safety standards, um, health regulations, as potentially uh, restrictions on trade as well. And similarly, in the macroeconomic front, monetary and fiscal policy inc and tax policies increasingly become subject to the requirements of, of, of globalization, that capital mobility and the mobility of corporation um, sets limits uh, to, for example, what your corporate taxes can be. It sets limits to how high you can tax, tax highly skilled uh, professionals that are who are very mobile globally. Okay? So um, in this kind of a model, globalization became sort of um, like uh, the end rather than the means. Um, so it's kind of, it was a kind of a, a reversal of the original set of priorities that the global economy went from being the means through which you can achieve domestic economic and social objectives, that domestic economic and social policies now had to adjust to the requirements of uh, deep economic integration and financial uh, globalization. Of course, that was only possible to the extent that domestic economic and policy regimes would, to some extent, converge, such as corporate taxes the rates would have to converge, regulations and standards would have to converge, practices with respect to subsidies or industrial policies or intellectual property rights would have to converge, otherwise they'd be viewed as, uh, as trade barriers uh, to, to, be, to be eliminated. Okay, so um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we have, you know, globalization is, is, can be designed in a number of different ways. And we think about sort of reimagining globalization. It's about thinking through uh, what are some of the elements of globalization over which, over which we have discretion, right? So if you want to think about how do we design globalization, there are at least, you know, sort of several elements of um, uh, uh, dimensions over which we need to make decisions. So with regard to po policies at the border, you know, which kind of flows should we try to liberalize? Uh, trade and goods, trade and services, financial flows, labor perhaps, right? Uh, flows of labor. To the extent that policies should reach behind the border, um, 
Should they reach behind the border? And if so, in which areas? Um, and, and ultimately, um, how should these rules be governed? How should they be enforced? Uh, should we have for formal multilateral institutions uh, that serve the, uh, uh, the role of enforcement or enunciation of these rules? Should the rules instead be enforced by hegemonic powers? Should they, they be enforced in a decentralized manner through um, norms and reciprocity, right? Um, and these are not hypothetical because different, um, these questions are not hypothetical because different models of globalization in history actually gave different answers uh, to these questions. So let me illustrate that by talking about sort of, you know, the most three versions of globalization we've had. Um, I've talked about the, uh, the immediate post-war period, which I've shown here as sort of Bretton Woods, the post-1990 hyper-globalization. But we can also go back a little bit further in history and talk about the gold standard, uh, which roughly between 1880 and 1914, with a brief resumption in the interwar period, was a different model of globalization. And so we can ask, sort of, did the, each, you know, you know, with respect to the questions I just laid out, did these uh, regimes aspire to capital mobility, to free trade and goods, to labor mobility, to the rules reach behind the border, and were there multilateral governance institutions? And you can see that these check marks are all over the place, uh, that, that these regimes gave different answers to these questions. So they were very different uh, types of globalization. So at least three different images or versions of globalization. I think one thing that our post-1990 model of hyper-globalization shares with the gold standard uh, is with respect to the degree to which the rules uh, reached behind borders. So I've already talked about this in the context of the post-1990 hyper-globalization model. But under the gold standard, it was mostly in the area of what today we would call monetary and fiscal or credit policies that the requirement under the gold standard that each country peg the value of its currency to gold, that it maintain free flow of gold and other financial assets, meant that each country's domestic monetary fiscal policies were highly constrained by the requirements of adherence uh, to the gold standard. So that was a sense in which domestic policies were tightly constrained uh, by, by globalization. And it's not a surprise that, in fact, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the, the very first self-consciously populist backlash against globalization uh, takes place under the gold standard. Um, this is um, uh, the United States in the late uh, 19th century, where a populist um, uh, by the name William Jennings Bryan uh, runs for uh, the presidency. And in the, in the speech uh, to the Democratic uh, um, Convention, uh, where he's been announced, uh, where he's been anointed the, uh, the Democratic candidate for president, he makes the famous sentence, uh, you shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, uh, you know, speaking very directly um, to, to this uh, question of um, uh, you know, the constraints that you know, the tight credit conditions that were killing um, the farmers uh, in the United States at the time as being sort of directly linked uh, to the consequences of the gold standard uh, with the anger of the farmers being directed to the northwest, to the northeastern elite uh, in the United States, the bankers and, and, and the financial establishment of New York um, and, 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 and Boston, um, who were the upholders of the gold standard against the interests of ordinary people, the farmers who were being killed. Uh, by the high real interest rates and declining uh, prices of commodities. Yeah. Um, so you, you will see there the echoes of the present day um, uh, 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 backlash to globalization with a very similar kind of, although it's now mostly workers in declining areas and not farmers, but the complaints are really not that dissimilar. Now, why is it that this particular, whether the hyper-globalization or the gold standard version, sort of once globalization in some sense goes too far and reaches too much, too deep, why does it create uh, tensions? Um, I think there are sort of, you know, three sources of, of tensions that a, a globalization regime has to manage. The most direct tension is in the area of, of economics, which is to say that there's a trade-off between the gains from specialization, of course, that was the argument for Adam Smith for having free markets, not just domestically, but also internationally. You, gains, you get the gains from trade that 
is through specializing in the things that you can produce well. Uh, but, there, but the trade-off is that there are also gains from productive diversification. Um, every country that has grown rich has typically done so by not specializing in a few things that it can produce well, but actually by diversifying, by producing many different things. And that would be a, a different tradition of argument uh, in, uh, in economic theory that goes back to Friedrich List and even earlier Alexander Hamilton, uh, who was a great believer of uh, you know, trade restrictions uh, and industrial policies to promote um, new industries at a time when the United States in the late 18th century was struggling to compete uh, with, uh, with Britain with its um, advantage in, in, in manufacturing. Second, there is a tension uh, with respect, in, uh, with regard to distributive justice, that's really about distribution. Um, we know that gains from trade and redistribution are two sides of the same coin. Uh, that is to say, you cannot have gains from trade without having redistribution. Um, in the very theory of comparative advantage, uh, those redistribution comes from re you know, from reallocating resources because specialization or reaping the gains from trade requires reallocating resources. And in the process of reallocating re resources, you create significant distributive costs. Uh, that's just in the standard conventional trade theory that we teach. And that means that you, know, you just have to manage uh, the redistribution. The more advanced globalization is, the harder it becomes uh, to manage uh, this, these redistributive tensions. Uh, third, um, at the third level, there is a tension at, so with much more directly about politics or accountability uh, to the electorate. Um, that here the tension is between reaping the gains from trade uh, by essentially um, reducing regulatory diversity because regulatory diversity can act as a transaction cost blocking uh, trade and goods, services and capital. But there are obviously gains from regulatory diversity because different nations are different. They have, they desire different taxes, different social protection systems, different labor markets, different consumer or digital or data regulatory systems. So you can maintain that, diver that diversity, that difference only by actually uh, having to some extent some restrictions on trade. So there the, the, the trade-off is that if democratically elected governments have to be accountable to this desire for difference, they cannot maintain completely free trade and free flow of capital in, in, in a deep integration sense of the term. Okay, now, um, what are the domains uh, in which uh, we ought to actually have international rules that restrain uh, domestic action? Here, some basic economics is very helpful. Uh, and I think the key point that often gets missed uh, in discussions of uh, international economic policy issues, where we put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on having global rules to restrain what national ec economic policy makers uh, can do, is to disregard the central uh, logic of economics, which is that for the most part in international economics, virtue is its own reward. Uh, what is to say that the reason that countries should follow fairly open uh, economic policies, you know, free borders to trade in goods, services, and capital, is because in principle uh, that has the potential to expand national welfare. So the argument for openness to trade and goods and capital is not to provide benefits to other countries so that you know you in some sense you have to have external rules to make you want to do that. It's that actually you're that's the way to uh, improve your own country's economic performance. And the, cons and the limitations there, of course, is that you have to manage your domestic economy well uh, in the sense of, of, of addressing market failures, addressing distributive problems uh, that might uh, make it difficult for you to, to reap those aggregate gains. So there's a strong presumption that in fact, well-governed countries, countries that are able to distribute the gains well and address market failures, are going to also choose policies that are, for the most part, you know, are open to um, the imports and uh, financial flows from the rest of the world. So a strong presumption that well-governed countries will choose globally optimum policies. Now, that doesn't mean that countries don't make mistakes or that there will be political failures, as of course there are always such failures. Uh, but when they do, 
uh, it's those countries themselves that bear the bulk of the costs. Um, and furthermore, uh, there is no presumption uh, that simply by having an international organization or international rules uh, that you can actually reliably prevent such mistakes, that you, not, you cannot really prevent reliably domestic political failures. You cannot address domestic governance failures by having international bureaucrats or international rules, which after all might be the result of a different set of lobbies, different set of rent seeking groups in terms of determining those international rules. So there's no guarantee that simply because we have external constraints that we're able to, to, to address uh, these, these domestic uh, failures. Now, I think there are two major exceptions to what I've just said about the, you know, this happy situation where if countries are well governed, they'll actually pursue also globally optimum uh, policies. The two major exceptions are areas where there are some beggar thy neighbor policies. Um, uh, and those are policies specifically that benefit, uh, that provide domestic benefits specifically at the cost of harm being imposed. So the harm that is being imposed on other countries is a direct and directly linked consequence of the domestic benefit. A classic example is exercising monopoly power in world trade. Uh, the only way you can get the benefits at home is by actually restricting supply uh, to the rest of the world and therefore reaping some rents from the rest of the world. Um, the second area is global public goods, where in fact uh, countries left to their own uh, would actually not pursue globally optimum policies. Um, you know, two critical areas there would be the example of climate change and also um, sort of the many policies in the area of global public health. And the pandemic is a very good example of that. Things like information exchange, development of vaccines, uh, research uh, are really global public goods. Uh, and in the absence of global rules or global coordination, these things will be uh, underprovided. However, most areas of trade that we negotiate under the WTO and regional trade agreements are not in the nature of global com commons or global public goods, so don't actually really fall. So um, to sum up, I think um, the, you know, the kind of globalization we should want um, is, is one that tends to produce benefits for all rather than a few. That requires focusing on areas where the efficiency gains are actually very, very high rather than areas where we've also almost reached the limit and we're going to get a lot of redistributive blowback for relatively limited gains um, uh, that, that focuses on, on areas where there is genuine argument for global governance. Um, those would be areas of bigger than neighbor policies um, and having rules for global public goods, but otherwise actually leaves a fair amount of space for domestic uh, autonomy, domestic policy autonomy, policy space. Now, I think the kind of, of um, globalization uh, this would require, and I'll just um, end here with respect to just a couple of brief remarks on trade, um, uh, is one, for example, that is, is an international trade regime uh, that is thinner uh, than what we have tried to achieve under hyper-globalization. So in the context of the US-China trade conflict, for example, what it means is establishing a kind of a modus vivendi, a peaceful coexistence where uh, uh, the rest of the world agrees that China has significant amount of room with respect to its subsidies, its property, intellectual property rights, its industrial policies, but that also uh, countries like the United States or UK or your, your, you know, European Union have a fair amount of room uh, to essentially to safeguard their regulations, their social protections, their labor regimes uh, in case imports from China or other countries uh, uh, threaten to undermine them. Um, and this could, you could imagine these, these kinds of policies in the areas of, of so-called social dumping or carbon border adjustments or uh, trade and investment restrictions in response to privacy or national security constraints. So this would mean that countries have, would have the right to protect their own regulations and standards, but, but not uh, the right to, to, uh, to actually uh, export them. So in some sense, this would be a kind of a return uh, to the spirit of the earlier globalization era, the Bretton Woods, although of course the issues and the actual practices today are very, very uh, different. But I think this is the direction in which uh, we need to go to. And I would argue that this is not, it looks like it's stepping back from hyper-globalization and it is, 
but in terms of actually fostering a, a, an environment, a healthy environment for international trade and international long-term investment to flourish, it's actually a more um, uh, a conducive environment uh, than one where uh, we're trying to push uh, on the hyper-globalization model, which I think increasingly people understand uh, is not realistic um, anyhow. Uh, so we can have a good and prosperous world economy even without hyper-globalization. So that's the, that's the message. Um, uh, and that, um, uh, and that, that, uh, that we should not be necessarily alarmed uh, by a certain amount of, in certain areas, a certain amount of deglobalization, if that's going to create a kind of a regime uh, that allows for uh, countries um, to solve their domestic problems, which is uh, really where the priorities ought to be. So let me just, uh, let me just stop here. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, we're very happy to host you today. Um, one thing you mentioned at the end was that you'd rather have a globalization that benefits all rather than a few. And this to me resembles a lot the, uh, the tension between a Pareto efficiency criterion and a Caldo Hicks efficiency criterion. And um, I mean, there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of transaction costs uh, to redistributing uh, gains uh, from those who gain to those who lose in order to make everyone uh, better off. And doesn't this restrict a lot of uh, what we can do? And That's a good question. So the question is, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe that's, uh, okay. sorry, you, you weren't finished. Go ahead. No, I was finished. <laughs> okay. was, so that's, that's a great question uh, that if you're going to make, um, you know, trade, um, uh, if you're going to make um, expansion of trade or trade liberalization uh, benefit um, the vast majority rather than a few, uh, you know, you'll have to entail a certain amount of redistribution. Uh, redistribution is not easy. We don't have access to lump sum uh, transfers. Um, and so the question is, you know, uh, how much, you know, sort of how much redistribution is it practical to engage in? And what does that imply uh, for how much liberalization we can undertake? That is an important economic principle here, uh, which uh, helps us think about this issue. And that principle is that um, if you think about the gains from trade um, and the amount of redistribution, I said earlier that those two things are two sides of the same coin, but the quantitative relationship between those two changes depending on where we are in liberalization. So the gains from trade at the margin are very large when the barriers that you're lowering are very high to begin with. So this corresponds with the public finance principle that a tax that's twice as high you know, hurts the economy, the efficiency cost is you know, four times as large uh, so that, that the efficiency cost of taxes rise with the square uh, of the tax. And so what that means in terms of trade is that the gains from liberalization of trade at the margin, after all, trade restrictions are like a tax. So when the, 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 the barriers are very high, the gains at the margin are very large. Whereas the amount of redistribution is actually rather linear uh, in the barriers. It doesn't matter whether tariffs are being reduced from you know, 150% to 140% or they're being reduced from 5% to 4%. Um, uh, that the amount of redistribution is going to be actually um, uh, uh, linear in the amount of, of uh, in the change in prices. So what that means is that when the barriers, that means that the amount of redistribution you get per dollar of efficiency gain actually uh, is very low for high levels of barriers, but gets to be very high for low levels of barriers. Putting it differently, when you're lowering barriers that are very high, you have a lot of room to redistribute uh, because for there's a lot of gains from trade relative to um, uh, the uh, redistributive amount of, amount of money you're redistributing. But when, as in current is the case, when tariffs are, for example, for most advanced countries at the range of you know, 5%, 6% for manufactured goods, then you've reached a level where you can sort of simple you know, numerical simulations would suggest that you're basically redistributing 
you know, five, six dollars of income for every dollar of efficiency gain you create, then with any kind of reasonable deadweight loss of redistribution, those transactions costs you were mentioning before, then it's, it's going to be not just administratively impossible uh, to redistribute the gains, it's going to be actually economically, the cost of redistribution will eat up all the gains from trade and therefore it doesn't work. So what's the, what's the lesson? The lesson is that you should be focusing on those explicit barriers in trade where in fact they are very high. Uh, and those are the areas where you actually um, have a prospect of being able to redistribute the gains uh, to the losers. But when we're dealing in areas where either the gains at the margin are relatively small. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be some interests uh, who gain a lot, but it just means that there will be other interests who will be losing nearly as much. Uh, so if those interests were actually still powerful, the former set, they'll still push for a lot of liberalization, but from an economic and a normative standpoint, we would actually not want to do that because it's Perhaps it's impossible on economic grounds to actually redistribute. So that's what I mean by sort of focusing our energies on areas where the barriers are the largest. Now, paradoxically, if you think about where is the world economy, where in the world economy is the largest barriers now to trade, where the most gains from trade exist, the potential, it's actually in the area of labor markets, because the barriers are so high uh, in, in, in labor markets. And that's actually where I think we should be putting our political, um, you know, this, this, you know, of course, sounds politically like a non-starter, you know, given Brexit and it's all about concern about immigration, concern about, you know, labor mobility. But the economic logic suggests that, in fact, if there's one area we have the prospects for redistributing the gains from an exchange, from gains from trade, it's actually in the area of some relaxation for labor mobility. We just have to be a little bit creative about thinking how we can credibly redistribute the gains uh, and as a, as, a, as a first step uh, to making it politically more appealing. Are there any countries or specific policies uh, you have in mind that uh, you find uh, role model, uh, have a role model uh, aspect to them in this, uh, with respect to that? You know, it's interesting. I mean, just um, a couple of days ago, the um, uh, a bunch of Asian countries um, uh, led by China uh, signed a new kind of air trade agreement, the Regional uh, Cooperation and Economic RCEP. Um, and, uh, and, and so when, you know, I haven't, I can't say I have digested the whole R agreement, uh, but you know, what it appears is, is a kind of a trade agreement that's much more in line uh, with the kind of, with the, with the direction I'm arguing for, because it's, it's focused uh, much more explicitly on explicit trade barriers at the border, like tariffs, uh, and much less so on, on regulations like investment rules or intellectual property rules or, or rules on, on subsidies or intellectual property. So in, in some sense, I think uh, it's the right direction uh, for trade agreements. And that, that would be sort of one recent example where I think uh, you know, some of this, uh, a new model compared to the type of uh, regional trade agreements we've had under European or, or US uh, leadership in the past. Okay, uh, we've got a question on our chat. Uh, how important are global, how important are global institutions and multilateralism in international trade? Or can bilateralism be a valid alternative? Yeah, I think, you know, multilateralism has the great um, advantage uh, that um, you know, smaller and less powerful countries um, uh, tend to benefit from a uniform set of rules and they cannot be discriminated against. Whereas bilateralism is a regime where it becomes very easy for large and powerful countries to effectively uh, you know, manipulate their terms of trade, uh, impose uh, conditions, uh, that that are able to extract um, you know the, the the bulk of the gains from trade from individual uh, trade partners. So if you're a small um, a developing country or a small country in general or, or a lower income country, you know there's a lot you know that that multilateralism is absolutely uh, the way to go. On the other hand, I mean there's you know what you know is there's a a different argument, however, which is that you know if you're trying to agree 
you know, some 200 countries with very, very different preferences and, and um, very different backgrounds, you know, it'll be, rel- you know, it'll be very difficult to agree. Um, so the multilateral agreements may be necessarily rather um, sort of um, uh, based on, on very little agreement, frankly. Uh, but there might be like-minded, smaller group of like-minded countries uh, that may be able to agree on a lot more. So in in principle, the European Union can integrate much more deeply than the world economy as a whole. So we don't want a world where we're preventing, uh, let's say North America or uh, the European Union to integrate more deeply because they can agree on more on common policies. So I think in, it's a, in, in practice, what we will like is to, what, we will, what we'll end up having is a kind of a, a background multilateral regime, but on top of that, you know, a bunch of regional agreements. And, and, the, and the thing to make sure that is that the regional agreements are not explicitly directed at keeping smaller countries or other countries out. And as long as they are trade creating, um, then it should be fine. Mm-hmm. May I ask in, in, with the context, in that context, like in the, the EU has, for instance, made uh, a lot of efforts to uh, use its trading power to, for instance, um, influence Russia's politics in Crimea. Uh, but also now, uh, more recently, is trying to influence, say, Hungary on their political development um, and stance uh, on, for instance, their ju- judicial system. Do you uh, find this in a, uh, like in accordance with your theory? Uh, like, sorry, um, do you think that this is in conflict with your theory, or do you think that? Uh, using free trade power to push democracy is, is a good thing? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, I think first I would say that the EU has to decide what uh, it wants to be. Uh, I think there's a fundamental inconsistency in the EU today, uh, which um, is that it has pushed very hard on economic integration uh, without um, similar integration on the political front. Um, so it's a kind of a very unbalanced integration where uh, fiscal and political institutions are largely unintegrated by economic policy making and economic regulations are very deeply integrated. Now, that creates a kind of a structural problem uh, for uh, the EU that I think ultimately the EU needs to solve uh, if it's going to be uh, a kind of a sustainable uh, situation. The original architects of the EU always thought that economic integration was going to be a stepping stone to further political integration so that economic integration would eventually result in political integration. But I think what happened after the 1980s was, you know, on, because of a variety of factors, uh, that the European Union started to push very hard, sort of single market agenda, deep integration, ultimately single currency and monetary integration that, kept, that resulted in a very unbalanced kind of integration. Now the problem with this is that you know, then it becomes a kind of a gold standard model for most countries that you have, you know, very strict limits on what you can do domestically uh, that are decided by institutions like the European Central Bank or even the European Parliament, or the, you know, the European uh, Commission, which looks like they're not very closely linked to the national electorates. So then to, and so there's a, there becomes, the, the, cha- the chain of democratic delegation becomes too long and too unwieldy and there's a, there's a, so-called democratic deficit uh, arises. Now, let me come to your question. Now, if the European Union uh, would ultimately be one that's also not just an economic union, but also a political union, then it becomes entirely appropriate for the European Union to act as a political entity. And and though it becomes a union of values, uh, as well as a union of economic integration. And ultimately, that's really the only sustainable equilibrium. So from that perspective, if we would look at the union as aspirationally a political union and as a union of values as well, then I think it's perfectly reasonable for European leaders to say that we are a union of democracies and human rights and rule of law, um, and that we want um, you know, sort of our members uh, to abide by, by these standards as well. So from that standpoint, I think it's, it's, it would be completely legitimate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in recent years, 
global institutions, including the WTO, have been undermined significantly by the US president. Do you think they're going to recover at all under the next administration? Where do you see organi organizations like the WTO moving in the future? Um, I think the WTO has been fundamentally weakened because of its, of its overreaching um, and, and that uh, Trump uh, was, you know, was very much a symptom of the, an underlying problem rather than uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the factor that drove the world uh, system, world economic system apart. So I think Trump you know, sort of made us in some way see more clearly um, that we were in an unsustainable path. So I don't think it's really feasible. It's not going to be feasible to return to a kind of a status quo ante and to revive uh, the World Trade Organization precisely because of the kinds of tensions uh, that I've discussed uh, in, in my remarks. And therefore, I do hope that we will end up with a strong WTO uh, because there are, you know, I don't, I'm not a fan of a lot of the WTO agreements, but for example, I'm a fan of the WTO dispute settlement procedure uh, it's really uh, remarkable uh, that, um, but I think it should apply, you know, to in a much more, much narrower range of areas than uh, is currently the practice. Uh, so I do, and I like it that it's, as I was discussing before, it's a multilateral institutions, uh, you know, uh, you know, Ghana matters as much as uh, the United States does. So I think, I think, I think that's, that's good. But we're not, I don't think even with a Biden administration, uh, we're not going back to the, um, to the old war. And, 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 and we need to work out a new settlement with China in particular that will have to operate uh, by somewhat different rules uh, than what's currently um, inscribed in the WTO agreements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, your, your critics would argue that Southeast Asia and China is an example of where hyper-globalization, well, or globalization has been effective as a growth strategy. I've read your book, so I know your response, but um, would you like to speak more about why you think that's not evidence in favor of globalization? Well, why, why don't you give me my response? Why do you give <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think this is, so I think, you know, the, uh, I think, you know, the, what's um, interesting about, you know, let's say China, which obviously is the, is the greatest beneficiary of the post-1990 global economic system. Uh, but China uh, presents a paradoxical case because even though China was a great uh, beneficiary of the post-1990 system, uh, you know, China played the globalization rule, played the globalization game, not by post-1990 rules, but actually by Bretton Woods rules. Uh, and what that means is that you know, China managed its currency, restricted capital flows, engaged in all kinds of industrial policies, subsidized industries and exports, of course had wide amounts of you know, state enterprises as a kind of a social safety net. Um, so did all the kinds of things that you were allowed to do under the Bretton Woods regime, but you were not allowed to do in the, uh, the post-1990 uh, policy uh, uh, regime. So, uh, you know, so the, sec the secrets of China is, is much more that it actually ascribed to the Bretton Woods rules than the high post hyper globalization rules. Now, I was lucky that while it was pursuing these strategies, uh, that the rest of the world basically just dropped all their, you know, barriers down and they, they presented an open market um, to, to China. So it's, it's probably true that if other countries had been uh, a little bit more selective and gradual in their liberalization, that maybe China's growth would have been a little bit lower, but not a whole lot. Um, I think China's, you know, I don't think, you know, one can imagine, for example, that, you know, that the United States would have been, uh, would have liberalized against China on a much slower path with occasional, much more aggressive use of safeguards uh, to protect uh, employment in the United States. Uh, that might have taken you know, a little bit of growth uh, out, of, out of China, but maybe you know, would have had the salutary effect that we would not have gotten Trump <laughs> elected uh, back in 2006, 2016, because the evidence we have is that in fact, uh, those parts of the United States uh, that were most adversely affected by the Chinese um, export uh, uh, shock uh, 
uh, were precisely the ones that shifted towards Trump and in some sense cost Hillary Clinton the election back in 2016. So uh, I think for the world world as a whole, it might have been a good bargain uh, to have China grow a little bit less, uh, have a somewhat more protection and somewhat less deep integration um, after the 1990s and have avoided four years of Trump. Uh, do you think that it's ever going to be possible for Africa to replicate a Southeast Asia style of growth? Why do you think they haven't been able to exploit um, export-led strategies and globalization? Yeah, um, big, good question. I mean, I think, you know, the big uh, advantage of the export-oriented industrialization strategy that a wave of countries pursued, um, you know, Japan in the 50s and 60s, and South Korea, Taiwan in the 60s and 70s, and of course, ultimately, most successfully, China uh, since the 19, uh, 1990s, uh, you know, is that, that, that manufacturing, especially export-oriented manufacturing, is, can be a very powerful engine for growth. But unfortunately, I, I think that um, the world um, has changed uh, significantly, the world economy and the possibilities of um, significant and rapid industrialization in the latecomers like the um, Sub-Saharan African countries are now much, much more limited. Uh, you know, for one thing, there's much more international competition. So it's harder to get a beachhead. Once you have had a China there, it's really getting, you know, very hard for, um, uh, and there's much less natural uh, or man-made protection in the system. So it's much harder for, uh, countries in Africa to develop sort of beachheads or niches in manufacturing. Secondly, perhaps more fundamentally, um, now manufacturing and global value chains have become extremely skill intensive, um, uh, much more so than they were um, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, so even very you know, labor abundant countries uh, are finding very difficult uh, to uh, put a lot of workers into manufacturing. And so uh, so we're not going to be getting these kinds of, of uh, uh, manufacturing-led growth experiences and, and uh, the experience of, you know, even relatively more successful industrializing countries in Africa like Ethiopia shows that the growth is not coming out of manufacturing. So what would be your um, policy advice to these developing countries in Africa then? Should they try to skill up their labor force? Well, that's always the answer for all countries and everything. But I'm, you know, unfortunately, you know, you just have to, you know, you don't have the luxury of waiting until you've been able to skill up all your workforce. So the, the, the tough challenge is to create relatively productive jobs with the workforce that you have, with the skills they have, uh, and not with the skills you hope they will have, you know, two generations later. Um, and, and that I think is a question to which frankly, I don't think anyone has a very, very good answer. Um, I, I think, you know, certainly at the margin, there is some room still for um, industrialization uh, because these countries are starting from so, some, you know, such low levels. So at the margin, there is some possibilities there. I think these countries have to look much more at sort of a kind of mid-range, uh, typically non-tradable services and expand uh, employment in sort of more modern kinds of services because that's services is effectively what's going to be um, where the labor will have to go in the urban areas. And many of them also have a lot of opportunities in sort of non-traditional modern agriculture with, you know, in, you know, improvements in yields and productivity are actually, you know, quite a bit of, uh, possible. So it'll have to be much more of a diversified strategy rather than simply relying on a few exports at a time. You'll have to rely much less on manufacturing than it did before. It has to be much more domestic market oriented uh, and less export oriented because that's not just going to create the kinds of jobs you want. Um, and uh, it'll have to be much more focused because it's sort of domestic market focused. It'll have to be focusing much more on sort of creating the kind of a middle class economy that can generate demand for, um, you know, for, you know, they can grow the domestic market for domestic producers. So these are some broad, um, you know, changes in orientation, uh, but how to make these operational through specific policies is something that I think um, uh, uh, we still don't know very well. Okay. Yeah, we've got another question from our chat. Could you please share with us your thoughts regarding deglobalization 
and concerns about global energy security? Well, I mean, I think, uh, you, know, you know, when I think of globalization, I, I don't um, necessarily think of, um, you know, this, that this is a kind of a unidirectional thing that you're even globalization, even you're globalizing more or you're globalizing less. You know, I think in my discussion, I pointed out that there are certain areas where I think we've gone too far in globalization. There are certain areas where we've gone, you know, not far enough. Um, so I think the example I gave, what I think in the area of, you know, trade liberalization, liberalization of services and financial uh, uh, globalization, I think there are many areas where we've gone too far, but I don't think we've gone nearly far enough with respect to an area like labor mobility, temporary work visas and, 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 and schemes of that kind. Um, similarly, I think there are non-economic areas where uh, I think we should globalize more. I think uh, we should be much more globalized in having um, a global public health regime. Uh, we should be more globalized with respect to having, you know, global uh, environmental uh, uh, and climate change agreements, uh, because those are true global public goods. Those are really where there's very strong argument uh, for stronger globalization, stronger global governance. So I, I think our priorities ought to be that we should avoid thinking in terms of you know pro or anti-globalization or more globalization, deglobalization, and, and focus on, on areas where I think there are very strong arguments for globalization, we haven't done enough, and areas where you know we've created more political costs and distributive um, uh, adverse distributive effects than, than it's really worth it, where I don't think there's it's much benefit for, for, for pushing. And global energy security, uh, any thoughts on that? Um, global energy security. I mean, I, I you know, I, you know, we're, um, uh, you know, at a time when I think, you know, we need to think of this issue uh, in a sort of very closely linked way with with climate change. I mean, I think we um, move, we need to move away from uh, subsidizing fossil fuels to 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 taxing them. I think the good news is there are a lot of areas where you know, non-renewables are, are starting to become very cost-effective and production has increased. I think we just need to sort of think of, of um, energy security um, as sort of on a path to a much you know, sort of better sort of um, you know, climate uh, change and decarbonization scenario. So we need to think about it alongside um, a decarbonization and, and we need much, much more action there. Uh, Ideally, international climate agreements, as I've suggested, uh, but realistically, I think this will have to be done um, uh, increasingly on a country by country level. And the fact that there's a lot of mobilization around the world on the part of young people like yourselves for, um, you know, sort of um, pushing for decarbonization and, and uh, climate conscious policies, I think, you know, that's very encouraging. I remember that uh, William Nordhaus uh, suggested a club of countries which uh, enacted protectionist policies against those countries which did not participate uh, against climate change? Uh, yes, so, you know, imagine there were some countries that were very strongly pushing, pushing very strong decarbonization policies, like, uh, you know, very significant taxes uh, on production that uses fossil fuels or, or strong carbon taxes. Then there would be very good argument for ensuring uh, that uh, that those policies are not undermined uh, by imports from countries, carbon intensive imports uh, from other countries where there aren't such policies. Uh, so then it would make sense to have uh, things like, you know, uh, carbon, carbon taxes at the border, uh, where uh, if you have your domestic um, uh, policies or your domestic production uh, you know, is, is being forced to compete with carbon intensive products from the rest of the world where you don't have such carbon taxes, uh, then there's some kind of an equalization tax uh, at the border. Uh, so those kind of carbon border taxes, I think would, you know, it's protection, but I think it's the kind of protection that makes uh, eminent sense. Well, thank you very much. I think we'll wrap it up there. That's been a very fascinating discussion. Thank you very much for speaking about this very important topic. Many thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me and uh, have a great evening. Yes, you too. You too. Bye bye.